Hello everyone and welcome back to my channel. My name is Nsala and I just want to start by saying thank you to everyone that has subscribed, liked my videos and you know shown me love by leaving comments. It really means a lot to me. Some people have sent me screenshots of them subscribing so all the love is really appreciated. So I want to start uh, today's case by just saying I heard about this case I think it was seven years ago and it's a case that has always touched me. I do regular checkups just to find out how far they are in investigations. And so I had a different case planned for today, a case that happened in one of the African countries, but it changed my mind last minute because I don't know, it just really touched me and I felt like you should also hear about it. So today's case is about the disappearance of Jennifer Joyce Cassie. Jennifer was born on the 20th of May in 1981. She was one of two children. She had a younger brother named Logan and they were just so close, so loving. They were just super tight and she was also very close to her parents, Drew and Joyce Cassie. And everyone just loved each other, just a loving family. Jennifer graduated from high school, from the Vivian Gaither High School and afterwards went to university and graduated in 2003 from the University of Central Florida with a degree in finance. At this point, life was looking so good for her. She had just graduated and that's when she got three job offers from the Central Florida Timeshare Company. And I guess this is how much they really wanted her, the fact that they gave her three different positions to choose from. And she began working for them as a finance manager. And in 2005, in November, she then moved into her own condo and was super excited because now she was on her own and living in her own space and had her own rules. But the only problem with this condo is that it was in a secluded area in the sense that there was a lot of construction, you know, a newly developing area and a lot of the other condos were not occupied yet. So that made her sometimes feel unsafe. And she was also in a relationship with her boyfriend, Rob Allen. They were just so in love and so happy. Everything was looking so good for her. And so at this point, she's now 24 years old. Everything is going well for her. And in January of 2006, it was uh, after the festive period, she and Rob decide to take a trip together. And she leaves her condo on the 18th of January and drives to Lauderdale, which is a three hour drive where Rob lived. And everything was okay. On the 19th of January, they then take their flight to the Virgin Islands where they had their vacation. They went with another friend of theirs and that friend's family. So everything was fun. They had so much fun different activities, everything was just so good for them and she really enjoyed her time according to what Rob and her family said. Afterwards, then on the 21st of January, they had a flight which they had cancelled and had to rebook then another flight for the 22nd of January, which was a Sunday. And while they were gone, her, her younger brother named Logan house set for her and he did this with two other friends of his. A friend named Matt and another friend named Travis and before they left because now Jennifer was coming back Travis actually forgot his cell phone in her condo so I just want you to remember that for later on and on the 22nd a friend of Jennifer and Rob picked them up from the airport in Miami where they landed and then they drive to Lauderdale where Rob is from and she decides to spend the night there instead of taking the three hour drive back to Orlando where her condo is as she was jet lagged and just wanted to rest. So it's now Monday morning and Jennifer decides to drive from Rob's place straight to work instead of having to go back to her condo just to save time. So she leaves Rob's place at 6 a.m. She takes the three hour drive and reports into her office at 9 a.m. And everything according to her co-workers and her boss was normal. She had just a normal productive day. She was her happy self and you know, just bright. She had a really bright personality, was loving, nurturing, caring. And everyone really loved her and had a really good relationship with her. And then at 6 p.m. she knocks off. But before she knocks off, she had a meeting with her boss. And her boss was actually a very good friend of the family, was very close to her father. 
So they have a little chat and discuss a couple of things. That's when he walks her to the parking lot and before then they exchange a couple of words again and they say their good nights and then she takes off going back to her condo for the day. She had, she had just finished her day. And it's believed after here that accounts are actually a bit fuzzy. They're not quite sure what happens after this but then she gets to her condo and the first thing she does is she calls her family gets on the phone with her mother, her father and her brother just to update them on how her trip was, how much fun she had, the different activities she and Rob had done that, you know, that vacation and just, you know, catching up on every other thing. And that's when Logan reminds her or informs her that his friend had forgotten his phone in her condo. So she promises that the next day when she gets into her office, she would mail her fo his phone actually to him. And because this was easier for her as at the office they had access to UPS and FedEx so she left her phone at her nightstand for that night so she wouldn't forget it the next morning. After that she gets on a phone call with her best friend and her friend actually says that she was in a bit of a funky mood actually because the long distance relationship was taking a toll on her like I said. Rob lived in Lauderdale, which was three hours away from Orlando where she lived. So they would only get to see each other on weekends and she felt like that was unfair. She couldn't see him any day of the week and be with him when she wanted to be with him. And this really frustrated her. But apart from that, she just updated her on her trip, how much fun she had. And after that, they said their good nights and that was it. And this is the last known phone call that was registered on her phone at 9 57 p.m. when she calls her boyfriend Rob and during this conversation Rob says that they actually had a little disagreement but nothing too major just a normal couple's argument but he never said exactly what it was about they just had a little argument and after that they said their good nights and she went to bed that is so it's believed but in the next morning when Rob wakes up and realizes that he hadn't received a call from Jennifer, he found it very suspicious and strange because he actually described Jennifer as his alarm clock. She always woke up first and immediately she woke up would call Rob so he would also get up and prepare himself for work. So that was very strange. But then Rob had remembered that she had mentioned that that morning she had a really important meeting so he thought she probably just lost track of time or was in a rush and didn't really have time to call him which was okay he tried calling her but when she didn't answer or return his calls he also had a meeting that morning so decided that he would get back to her or call her after the meeting and everything went on and he probably thought like okay it's nothing too strange but you know it's all good but when Jennifer didn't report into work the normal time she usually would, her boss actually became very frustrated and upset because it was a really important meeting for the company and for Jennifer's career. So that really upset him. But when she was two hours late, he began worrying extremely because this was unlike Jennifer. She was, she was a person who was very punctual, loved her job and she had a really strict routine. She always woke up at a particular time, got to the office at a particular time, did all her work, left at a particular time. So they knew that this was very much unlike her and if she ever encountered any problems, she always made sure to call into the office and inform them if she had a flat tire or she was sick and couldn't make it into work that day. And that really worried him. He then decided to call her father since they were very close and had a good relationship and informed him that Jennifer hadn't turned up to work that morning. And this really concerned Drew and his wife Joyce because they knew their daughter was very punctual and really loved her job and would never risk them having, you know, a bad reputation because she couldn't turn up to an important meeting. And that's when they decided to call her phone multiple times, but she never responded. She never picked up her calls and they couldn't get hold of her. So they then decided to take the two hour drive because they lived in Bradenton while she lived in Orlando. 
and they take the two hour drive and decide to call her condo manager while they are on the road. Joyce then talks to the condo management and asks them to go check her daughter's um, condo just to make sure everything is okay. But then they struggled with this because this was against regulations and rules which they had. But because this was a very serious situation, the condo manager finds another employee and together while Joyce is on the phone, they enter Jennifer's condo and they searched around but you know didn't find her and didn't find anything strange so they leave and inform Joyce that everything looks pretty normal and Joyce calmed down a bit thinking like okay there must be a reasonable explanation so while they're on the road Lo Logan is actually ahead of them in a different car with his friend Travis while Drew and Joyce are in a car behind them so they're just driving together and Logan actually arrives at the condo before his parents and when he gets there it's 3 p.m. He then decides to run up to a condo and just starts banging on the door, you know, just hoping that if he makes enough noise in case for some weird reason maybe Jennifer is now back in the condo or the condo management just hadn't seen her, that she wakes up, she probably overslept or you know, they're trying to find different reasons just to help them calm down or deal with the situation. But there's no response and her door is locked. So he looks across from her condo and through the window sees a couple of men and tries banging on their window just for them to help him out with information. But these men completely ignore him. It's like he isn't even there. He bangs and calls out for their help and you know yells out but then they completely ignore him. And 15 minutes after Logan arrived with Travis, that's when his parents also arrived and they had an extra key to Jennifer's condo. And they then unlocked the condo and as they are walking through the condo, everything actually looks very normal. Every, nothing looks like there was a fight or a tussle or you know, furniture is not knocked over, it just looked like a normal Jennifer condo. And as they go to the bedroom, Joyce realizes that there are two skirts on her daughter's bed showing that she woke up that morning and tried to mix match in her outfits for her day. She found that her nightgown was on the floor so she clearly undressed it when she woke up in the morning and that her bed hadn't been made yet and she always made her bed so you know it was believed that she had spent the night in her condo. And as she proceeds to go to the bathroom she notices in the bathtub that there is sprinkles of water in the bathtub and the shampoo bottle is open and is wet so wet hands had touched the shampoo bottle so they believe that she had taken a bath that morning and there was a wet towel on her washing machine as well so they were now confused it's clear that she had spent the night in her condo she was there that morning but then where is she because if she's not at work where else could she be so seeing all this information they then decide to call in the police because everything was just feeling so wrong and so strange but the police look at it as a 24 year old woman who hasn't been at home for a couple of hours and they don't find it strange they're thinking that you don't know what other life she has she could be out there probably having fun they don't know if she's a good or bad girl so they're thinking she's probably wild and just went out and missed her meeting you know but her family knew that she wasn't the type of a girl she wouldn't do that that's when they start calling in different relatives and family they start taking flyers down the corners of the street and just start handing them out to everyone and anyone who would take one. And they're just, you know, frantic and looking for their daughter at this point. But then they decide that the best way to reach a larger audience is to do an interview. They sit down and do an interview and in this interview, they are basically begging for Jennifer's safe return. Trying to talk to her if she's out there and listening to basically come back home. And if there's someone out there like a perpetrator, an attacker, someone who probably took her away or kidnapped her to basically bring her back home and they were willing to do anything for a safe return. And this interview actually proved to be very helpful and very just so amazing and blessing because two days later they receive a call and this call is from another apartment complex which is just 1.2 miles away from Jennifer's um, condo just literally down the street from where she lived and they basically identify her black Chevy 2004 Malibu car and 
they are able to identify because during the interview the parents gave her details like her number plate and all this type of things and when the police come to search around everything looked normal everything looked in place so they wait for her hoping that she'll probably return back and you know, everything looked okay but when it became too long they then decide to call in the forensic team the forensic team then decides to come and do their forensic investigation but this was frustrating because the only thing they could find which was foreign or basically not of Jennifer's was a partial fingerprint and then like the tiniest, the smallest speck or drop of blood that's all they were able to find which was not informative they couldn't use it to really create um, information or find out who this was for or who it belonged to that's when the family then continues looking around they basically never give up they continue searching for Jennifer and that's when the police realized that there was a CCTV camera and this CCTV camera was pointing towards the pool, pool side where this whoever dropped the car or whoever dropped it if it was Jennifer or someone else would have been spotted by that camera they again get this from the apartment complex and please bear with me because this point becomes really frustrating and really gets to me and really upsets me I don't know how this is even possible really as they go through the CCTV camera and I'm now going to play for you the footage you see someone dressed in white and at this point they didn't know if it was a man or a woman but someone dressed in white drives up and parks the car in the parking lot they then sit in the car for 32 seconds after those 32 seconds the person walks out of the car and just walks away from the car and as they are walking away from the car at the point where the cctv footage should be the clearest and most helpful in identifying who the person could be or showing at least their face the problem with the pool gate was it had bars little uh, individual black bars and the cctv camera only captured footage every two to three seconds so as the person would walk the bar would block them would obstruct them and as they walked again the next two to three seconds when it would capture them again they were hidden by another bar so i don't know if this makes sense to you but they were always being blocked by the bars their face so it was impossible to see who it was whether it was a man or a woman it was just impossible the police then decide to send this footage to nasa hoping they could enhance it and give them more information but then this proves to be useless because nasa couldn't do anything about it and they sent this then to the fbi i'm so sorry about that guys so the battery died but i'm back now um and so i was talking about the fbi so the footage was then sent to the fbi so they could give more details as to who it was or probably help where nasa couldn't help but all they could come up with was a um, description of who the perpetrator might be and all they could come up with was that the person was either five foot three or five foot five and had really large feet so that's all that the police had to work with so their next plan was to use the dogs the police dogs and they picked up the scent and they tracked all the way from where the car was back to her condo so and specifically at the staircase they literally stopped at the staircase didn't go further didn't stop earlier just the staircase and the police came up with two situations or scenarios which they believe happened number one it's either the perpetrator walked all the way back from the car to the condo and for some reason I don't know why they think the dog stopped them or number two that the attack actually took place at the staircase because remember her apartment her condo wasn't disturbed furniture wasn't knocked over everything looked proper and her car keys her cell phone briefcase handbag were all missing so they believed that that morning she left her condo and was heard heading to work when she was attacked probably at the staircase and remember that the only people there were the construction workers the place wasn't fully occupied so it would have been easy for the person if they watched her since she had a very strict routine to learn which time she would leave the condo and know exactly when to attack her so they probably thought this was a meditated attack and not a spur of the moment type of attack and the police then was forced since they had no other information no leads nobody was coming up with tips they started investigating investigating and they looked first into her family 
and they started with the parents but they were quickly ruled out because remember they lived in Bradenton so it was proved that they were not in Orlando at the time of the attacks they also looked into her boyfriend Rob Allen but Rob was also at work like I said he had a meeting that morning and it was easily his, his whereabouts were easily proven he had a really strong alibi and the next plan was then to look into the construction workers since they were the ones all around her and her family talked about how she always felt uncomfortable because these construction workers always kept called her, whistled when she passed by, always made some weird and funny sounds basically which made her feel so uncomfortable and always so cautious and aware. There was even a situation where the week before she took the trip with her boyfriend, she had been having problems in her condo that needed to be fixed and these construction workers would come to come and fix the problem and they were taking so long like it they should thought it would be a couple of days or probably hours but when it was taking about a week it really frustrated her and what she would always do is when they were in her condo with her she didn't want to be alone with them so she would either call her parents or her boyfriend so they'll be on the other line and in case she was in distress or had been attacked and they heard her you know calling for help they would be able to immediately call the police to her aid so that's just how cautious she was about the situation and the construction workers she didn't trust them at all and she would even be yelling at them when they would be working because she felt they were so slow and she just wanted them to hurry up and leave her condo and leave her alone so it's believed during that time they could have studied her condo or her place and if they did attack her in the condo that they would know exactly where she would be how to clean up or do everything else around and the next lead or the next suspect they went to look into was when the whole construction worker place didn't work out because before i forget the construction workers were all foreigners they were not registered so when they would in interrogate them or try to look into what happened by questioning them a lot of information was lost due to translation and a lot of them basically disappeared, they vanished because they were not registered. So police coming back and forth really scared them, they feared being deported. And a lot of them lived there in the condos because it was easier for them instead of them having to travel back and forth from other residents to work every day. They just lived there full time. And this they literally disappeared, they all vanished and ran away. So it's unclear as to probably they knew who did it and just want, didn't want to be implicated. But it's believed it's because they were not registered and they were illegal in the country so they feared being deported. The next thing they looked into her co-worker because when that avenue closed they looked they confiscated her computer and went through all her emails and found that there was a co-worker that had been pursuing her or proposing and she didn't want because she was in a relationship but they were a little bit aggressive about it and didn't budge when she said no. So they looked into that avenue but unfortunately they were able to rule him out and the next thing they looked into was her ex-boyfriend matt remember i said that her brother logan house set for her with two of his friends travis and matt who was her ex-boyfriend as well as logan's friend and matt was actually within the area the time it's believed she could have been attacked the night before actually so they probably thought that he was still an ex that was not over the whole breakup and probably drank too much and was intoxicated and went to attack her but his alibi was really strong and he was also quickly ruled out. This left basically nobody, no other suspects and nothing at all for the police to work with and that's when the police seemed less interested and serious with the case according to her parents, the Cassies, and they became more infuriated and frustrated with the lack of seriousness and urgency it's like they had all given up they felt that they had done the best they could they checked and all bodies of water because i believe there was like rivers or ponds and they searched they sent divers there they looked in all pipelines and everywhere they felt that a body would have been hidden because the time from the when the boss called her parents to the time when the the car was dropped off by the suspect was only one hour so let's say that the the boss called her parents at 11 a.m and the person driving the car dropped the car at 12 a.m so it was only one hour so they believed whatever the person did to her body had to be done really really fast they only had a really short time gap for them to do whatever they did so this case has remained unsolved and has been a cold case 
For about 10 years she was classified as missing and was later on classified as dead and this really broke her family's heart because they felt that the state was giving up on them and on their daughter and as if that she, she they didn't care anymore and just wanted the case to be over with but in 2010 one of the housekeepers that worked in the condos and did cleaning in that condo know, knew that one of the construction workers named Chino actually was the guy who was fixing stuff for her when she needed repairs in her condo and according to what she said the person in the cctv footage resembled him a lot and she meant by the way that person walked or just their appearance and their height she really thought it was chino and chino at the time in 2010 was incarcerated so police went to the jail where he was or the prison where he was and went to in interview him but he also took a polygraph test and passed so i guess that was enough for them to rule him out as a suspect and yeah this is basically it on the case her parents have never given up they've continued fighting for their daughter they want to give her a dignified burial they at least if she's dead just want her body so they can show their last respect and know where they can visit her from time to time and not just know that she's out there in the cold and you know hasn't been shown love or respect and this is it with this case so I don't know if you can tell me what you think actually happened to us, the construction workers, the ex-boyfriend, who do you think probably, I feel like it, it's definitely the construction workers, I'm not, sure, I'm not sure but that's what I think the most likely uh, scenario and that's it for this video and I hope to see you in my next video and until then goodbye and take care, bye.